I just can't resist these, these objects that I don't even know what they are. She knows where the good stuff is and knows how to find it. I say I'm just like a child. My attention span is very short. I think of her as a cross between sort of a Julia Child and a Margaret Mead of the jewelry land. She spots these things that in and of themselves on the shelf in a store look insignificant. Everybody laughs because Ramona comes home with all kinds of things. And incorporates them into something that makes them grand and special. When people walk down the street and they're wearing one of Ramona's figulas, they, people will go, oh, Ramona. I wouldn't be satisfied with a little string of pearls anymore, I'll tell you. Ramona Salberg, a Northwest master of jewelry art, making jewelry art and teaching jewelry making since the 1940s, Ramona Salberg is a true adventurer, a world traveler intently interested in the crafts and artifacts of other cultures. Ramona's one-of-a-kind found object jewelry reflects this passion. Born in Watertown, South Dakota in 1921, Ramona moved with her parents and older siblings when she was one and a half years old to Seattle, Washington, where they settled in the Wallingford District. I went to University Heights grade school and I went to Lincoln High School, so uh, I'm pretty, a pretty local girl. Ramona's entire family was artistic, but her older sister was her biggest influence. Everything she did just seemed wonderful. She was pretty, she wore nice clothes, she had boyfriends, and she was a good artist. Well, it was the artist part that interested me. I liked the clothes too, but she went to the university and was an art major, and she made a ring in her jewelry class, and I thought, when I grow up, I'm going to take a jewelry class and I'm going to make a ring. I'd gotten just B's and I will say a couple C's, but mostly B's in my art classes. When I took that jewelry class, I couldn't believe it. I got an A. I mean, I had gotten an A in a couple of English classes and a creative writing or something like that, but an art class, I could never get an A. And Ruth Pennington, who was the jewelry teacher, and a tough teacher, too, gave me an A. Well, what else could I do? I had to become a jeweler. My jewelry was very conservative. Most of them were kind of uh, that freeform amoebic shape, which was very popular in the 30s and 40s. After graduating in art from the University of Washington, Ramona went right into the Army, joining the WAX so that she could go overseas. Goodness knows, I looked better in navy blue than in khaki, but, but I wanted to go overseas. I wanted to see what was happening in the world. Sergeant Solberg spent five years in the Army, working initially as a recruiter, then as a clerk typist when she finally got her wish to go overseas. Stationed in Germany, she spent her free time bicycling with friends and visiting museums. And after her tour of duty, Ramona traveled in Europe before returning home to Seattle. After I got out of the Army, I realized I really had to do something. And so I took education classes, which I hated. I went out and did my practice teaching, and I thought, this is what I was made for. I loved it. I loved it. Starting out as a junior high school art teacher prepared Ramona for teaching at the university level. I didn't want the, my art classes to just be kind of indoor PE periods. Uh, I wanted the, the children to learn something, to learn something about art. Um, I stressed the elements of design. Uh, no matter what we were doing, I would talk about color, about composition. Um, you know, I tried to make art a serious kind of thing, not just a, a frivolous, uh, sit and scribble kind of thing. Her university career spanned 28 years, the first 11 years at Central Washington University and the last 17 years at the University of Washington in Seattle. She loves her students, she uh, excites them, 
And because that, uh, of the fact that she really is so enthusiastic about her subject, you want to work really hard and do your very best. Her observation of detail and her respect for other people's ideas uh, is a really wonderful quality in a teacher because she's aware of what you're doing, she pays attention to what you're trying to do, she doesn't get in there and uh, try to change your ideas, she just encourages the, the good part of it. She's never trying to impress the students with her background. That's not Ramona. She gets right with them and works with them as they are and tries to bring up their, the quality of their work. And she's highly successful at that. And if you ever saw Ramona's students when they laid their things out during a critique, you would find that everybody did work very individually. And I think that's a real credit to someone like Ramona, who can inspire people to go off in all these di different directions and, and come out with, with something that you know, still works and looks good. I just love teaching, I really did. In fact, if you say I'm a jeweler, or I'm a this, I'm that. What I really am is a teacher. That was the most important thing. I mean, I feel like I came from a long lineage, you know, in the sense that Ruth Pennington was teaching at the university, and then Ramona was a student of Ruth's, and then I became a student of Ramona's. And in a way, Ramona was a great influence, but you still have to look back. Ruth had a great way of taking also found pieces that she picked up either on the beach or uh, when she traveled and made wonderful rings and, and necklaces. And I know that she was a great influence uh, for Ramona. She sort of freed me from the idea that you have to use uh, faceted stones, you had to use gold uh, because she did a number of pieces that were less than precious, uh, utilizing less than precious materials. And I think it loosened me up a little bit. Ramona really is unique as an American jeweler, and I say jeweler rather than metalsmith, as many people working in that field would call themselves, because metal is not the primary impetus for Ramona. It is the objects that she uses metal to connect in jewelry. But her whole life seems to be kind of structured around a very um, unusual sort of thread for jewelers or metalsmiths. I would started to travel and when I would travel I would see interesting uh, little artifacts. You know, I'd say, well, what's that for? And, uh, amulets, things like this. I couldn't carry much and I couldn't afford much, so I would buy these little odds and ends. Well, what do you do with them after you get them? You kind of play with them and look at them and finally you hang them around your neck. As other uh, jewelers were maybe working with faceted stones and finding innovative ways to mount them, Ramona was looking at beads and found objects, so she had an entirely different kind of non-traditional and non-precious focus on materials that I think really made her stand out uh, as different from the others. I think when we look at jewelry in sort of more recent Western culture, it, it has so much to do with, with value of materials being the value of the piece. And when people like Ramona, who used things that were really not inherently valuable, um, that really changed people's way of looking at 
at jewelry as a medium of expression. Almost always Ramona's pieces are a plaque shape that are very, you know, they're worn front and center. And they're not narrative in that they tell a story, but that they transform something that is not perceived as valuable. In that transformation of putting it onto a piece of jewelry, it changes its value and it gets more meaning. I think that that's what people associate with Ramona. Ramona was fascinated originally, I believe, with a lot of ethnic jewelry, ethnic beads, um, even odd things that she would find, as we all know, in other cultures in Africa, something that we might consider trash, literally, a part to a car or something becomes an interesting object because they've never seen it, so it's precious. Well, Ramona clued into that immediately, and, and she would love all that, and that would sort of inform her own work, I know. So she would come back with beads that she'd bartered, and these are not precious in the sense they're made of precious stones or gold or silver, but obviously to her they were very precious and she worked all that into her jewelry. You get addicted to this bead business and you buy beads and you buy beads and, and then how do you take care of them? Well, I put them in jars. I've got everything from peanut butter jars to baby food jars to whatever. Well, her jewelry certainly isn't copies of ethnic jewelry and it's, it's never been that. It's informed by all these cultures around the world. So long before it was fashionable, she was not only using found objects, but she was doing something I guess you would call very diverse jewelry in the sense that it was all about other, other cultures. You know, I, I have treasures in every drawer. Oh well, this is a good drawer. It's all kinds of bone things. This domino shouldn't be in there because the dominoes are really in, oops, in this drawer. She's always coming back from someplace that I didn't even know existed. And she's always traveled into the deepest part of that country and learned those people's, um, you know, about their physical objects and then, then brings them back. I think that, that that then becomes an extension that she offers through her work. Her travels are wrapped right up into what she says and what she gives you. I would go to bazaars and flea markets and things like this, and I would look at everything, but I would find a shape that attracted me or usually a shape or a piece often made out of bone because they were often used for amulets and things like that. So I called them my amulets too. Oh, this is a good drawer. Uh, this is uh, amber. I have several drawers of different kinds of amber. Because of Ramona's extensive travel experience, she was asked to lead tours in various parts of the world. We went to look at the craft, we went to look at the temples, and all this, uh, the wonderful heritage, heritage that India has, all that beautiful color. When we were in India, we had driven six hours across the desert in Rajasthan to go to a place called Jaisalmer, which was a desert town uh, um, in the west of India. And we're walking down the street, Ramona and I, and I hear, Ramona, Ramona. And I, we turn around, and there's a little kid hanging out a doorway, waving, you know, to Ramona. And I said, who's that? And she said, oh, I think when I was here a couple years ago, uh, he probably remembered meeting me. Isn't that great? Oh, goodness, this is a nice jar of stuff. Uh, these are all from India. They're, they're ivory, and uh, I don't you know, know exactly what to do with them anymore, but uh, there they are. She would uh, get herself prepared about that particular culture and what we look, should look for when we're traveling, and that helps us all. And then she would be on the alert also for finding choice items in weird places. A lot of people don't ever realize the true value of what travel is all about. And I think for Ramona, she gets interested in the culture, the, the way people, 
the people in those countries do things and the way they make them. She has great respect of the crafts in every country. I think that it's part of her excitement about travel is that she's able to, you know, s seek out the people who are making the crafts in those countries. Certainly my travel has influenced my jewelry a great deal. Whether it's made out of raffia or it's made out of uh, pig's teeth or whatever, I look at it and I'm so interested in the way it's done and if it's worn for a special occasion or whatever. Yes, it, it has affected me and, and as I say, I it's loosened me up. I'm willing to put almost anything in a piece of jewelry uh, if I think it works together. It, that, it has to do that. When a trader comes to town, uh, you know, they pass the names on, kind of like the gypsies putting a mark on your house. You're a, 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 a good customer. All right. Then they say, hello, Ramona. And I know immediately it's Mohammed or one of the traders. And sometimes there are two in town or three at a time. Oh, no. I, uh, that, I don't even want to look at that. It's too expensive. These are from Senegal. 2000. Oh my. Call Yoruba. Oh, that was weird. Yoruba brand. Oh yeah. Was, uh, here, you can put these back. Yeah. Do you have any polka dot? This one. Oh, yeah. This. Where, where's the amber from? Here we go. This one. That's a very good price. Thank you very much for calling me. She puts these things together that are immediately appealing and accessible to a wide audience, and she keeps them affordable. I wanted people to wear my jewelry. I, I like to see other people wearing it, and I, um, I try to keep the price low so people could buy it. She brought in her fibulas. And as she opened the package, people's hands would go, crunk, <laughs> and they would walk around and say, I'm, I'll decide in a minute, I'll decide. But they all went. They just all disappeared. It was like popcorn. And we, we were talking about the hundreds of those fibulas that, that she has made. And in that 12 years, the price has remained almost within $5, the same price, because she wants those people who know her work and appreciate her work to have a small part of it without having to invest a huge amount of money. I've been much happier since I have a gallery now. Hello, Karen. Hi, Ramona. How are you doing? Oh, I've got a few things. Oh, good. Good. I always hated oh, the old wow. thing about selling oh, jewelry. Wow. I never great? knew what price oh, to put on it. And I, I practically gave oh, my jewelry away for years. That's all I have today. Oh, but I, I could make more. I, you know, I make more. Make, make more. more. <laughs> make more. All right. Ramona being Ramona, it's almost if you said, "Oh, I just absolutely love that." What she'd really like to do is say, "Oh, well, take it. You can have it." And I think the education about the world that she's gained in her travels have made her want to be able to share her art with more people. What that means, too, is to be able to make something that packs all the wallop of a real piece of art, but that's very available, and that, the, and that matters to her. She doesn't work with diamonds or rubies or pearls. Well, maybe she might use them once in a while, but they're things that people have experienced, like little compasses and, and coins and and wonderful things that people can relate to. And she works them together into a beautiful design. If you think of her use of found objects early on, you can look at art uh, history and think of the assemblage or the collage artists like Schwitters and people who were using collage who were taking things from everyday life and recombining them and transforming them in another way uh, that was going on in the art world, that kind of approach to working with materials. And then Ramona was doing that in 
and jewelry, and in that sense using non-precious materials in a very sophisticated way. Oh, that's great! Ramona's jewelry fits in an interesting way to the whole evolution of jewelry as talisman, as portable wealth, as status. And uh, it takes on a different kind of sensibility in the contemporary world because it is still adornment. As art jewelry, it is something that represents a distinctive point of view, which is akin to status, though it's not diamonds. And it certainly addresses how the wearer feels about herself or himself as uh, a canvas. Well, a canvas or a frame for art, if we think of the traditional idea of a painting as art. I've always felt that jewelry is, a, is, if it's worn, is a great form of public art because it's out there. And in that sense, that's the best place for Ramona's work is out on the street. I don't make the kind of jewelry you wear to a, the governor's ball. I make kind of everyday jewelry. She fits into the kind of artist jeweler category, but she still has wearability as something that really does concern her. But another thing about my jewelry, uh, uh, you have to be ready for conversation when you wear it. I know um, Marcel Duchamp talks about that a work of art is one that involves the artist and the spectator, and it doesn't become art until there is a spectator, until there is the audience, the viewer. I had a friend who says, every time I go to the store, the checkout clerk asks me about my jewelry. And then their interaction with it makes it into a third thing. I, I, and I guess I like to think of something like that happening with Ramona's work, that it, it doesn't mean to evoke a specific response or a specific um, story, but it might evoke curiosity or wonder. You can't get lonesome if you wear my jewelry. Well, I certainly thank you for filling the hall. Up on the table, I have jet, amber, and coral. Imagine what this is. Retirement from but, the University uh, of Washington didn't stop Ramona from teaching. Fact. For many years, she led jewelry making workshops, and she still gives many talks for the Bead Society and other organizations, such as the Northwest Designer Craftsmen. Ramona's many accomplishments include being a fellow of the American Craft Council since 1975 and receiving the Washington State Governor's Award in 1987. Her jewelry is in the collection of the Renwick Gallery at the Smithsonian, the American Craft Museum, the King County Arts Commission, and many other museums, and numerous regional and national private collections. I don't have a big plan. You can tell I don't. The way I, I do things kind of backwards sometimes. I don't have any great goals in life except to be happy and, you know, that's about it. She dwells on positive things, you know, that's what she emphasizes in her life. I mean, this is a woman who, you know, knows how to chart her course and, and just do it. I think of Ramona in a sense of being this person who is everything of her experience and her life. The way she dresses, the jewelry she makes, her welcoming spirit, she is there sort of like the great ambassador of the ethnic world welcoming people to see it through her eyes and her jewelry. There aren't that many people you meet who have the generosity of spirit that Ramona does. Ramona, I don't think will probably ever fit anyone's description of an old lady. She's not afraid of things, you know. She's not afraid of doing something unconventional. She's always wearing something interesting and brings to whatever she wears a color sense that I think is maybe part Norwegian, part Balinese, part <laughs> Ethiopian. <laughs> I've followed the contemporary crafts field for 30 years and 
the jewelry field as one component of that, that lawn. And I can say without hesitation that Ramona Solberg is a true original. And I'm sure that if any anthropologist finds a piece of mine, you know, uh, a thousand years from now, they're never going to figure out how these cultures got together.